Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we're going to be checking out five suspension mods uh, when done improperly that can ruin how your car handles. Now I just gotta put these down. Oh god. Oh. So the first one I want to talk about are the spring clamps and this is probably the most ridiculous of them. I honestly had never even heard of them uh, but I was looking for lowering springs and this was one of the options that popped up and I thought you know like this is crazy uh, but apparently it's a real item you know it exists and the idea is you just clamp down there on the spring and so that reduces uh, the spring height so you can lower your car. So this is a way of lowering your car. Well this is crazy uh, for several reasons. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is just safety you know these are inner interfering with the spring they can come into contact with it they can kind of wear down on it uh, you know you could trim the ends of these bolts here so that you did have you know better clearance with it uh, but regardless you know this can come into contact with your shock these if you did have a shock that went through your springs I don't even think they would allow for it uh, due to clearance issues um, but you know these could damage things around them that are moving up and down and they could also move around as this you know with time so as they move around they may change the way the spring bends uh, and can reduce the effectiveness of the spring so from a safety standpoint they seem like a dumb idea the other crazy thing is from a suspension travel point of view so what you're doing with this is you're reducing the amount of suspension travel that you have but you are not changing your spring rate at all and so the reason this is crazy is because let's say you're going over this bump here and so with your original suspension at its original height you go over that suspension and your spring compresses four inches now you've lowered your vehicle with these clamps but you haven't changed the spring rate you always want to make sure the spring rate is higher if you're going to lower your car so you have that same four inches of travel but now your tires are going to come into contact with the wheel wells or another interference you might hit bump stops uh, something like that within your car but you're going to have an interference happen because you haven't changed the spring rate but you've lowered your car so you know a better scenario than doing these clamps uh, perhaps would be lowering springs but even better would be to use coilovers where you're going to have a stiffer spring rate uh, and you're also going to have adjustable height and have a matched spring and damping rate next we have lowering springs so you may use lowering springs to lower the center of gravity of your car and thus improve the handling uh, you can also improve the aerodynamics typically by lowering your car uh, but there are some very good reasons why you may not want to I probably would never recommend someone use lowering springs simply to lower their car um, I think there's better methods of doing it so we're going to get into the disadvantages of simply using a lowering spring to do it these first two uh, simply for lowering your car in general you're going to increase the likelihood of bottoming out and you're also typically going to increase the amount of negative camber you have uh, by throwing in uh, lowering springs and so this can reduce the amount of grip that you have or you know you may need to buy a kit in order to correct it now specifically to lowering springs some disadvantages you can't adjust the ride height of your car so once you throw these in uh, that's your set ride height and so you know some people may cut these uh, that can be a bit dangerous to do so I wouldn't recommend that certainly um, but basically once you put these in that's your ride height you can't adjust it uh, so you don't really have flexibility there also uh, it's going to require stiffer springs because you've lowered your car as I mentioned earlier uh, with those spring clamps and typically with a higher spring rate you're going to have less mechanical grip now this may not seem totally intuitive so I have a separate video explaining uh, why that is um, but essentially you know you're going to increase uh, the likelihood for a, a wheel to lose grip a, a tire to lose grip if you have a much stiffer spring uh, supporting that tire now next uh, the spring rate won't match the damping rate and this is one of the critical reasons why you wouldn't want to do it um, basically you're going to have a stiffer spring which you're matching with your, with your original shock uh, and the damping rate isn't going to match the spring rate so the spring rate is now stiffer meaning you get less travel overall of the suspension but that previous shock absorber was designed for a spring that would have more travel so it's designed to be effective across a broader range and now you're shortening the range across which it operates and so in doing so you're making that shock absorber less effective and you can also damage it so a better idea in my opinion would be simply to go over to coilovers uh, or a matching you know spring and shock combo the reason coilovers are great they're height adjustable you can often adjust the damping and the rebound and you also get a matched and you get a matched spring rate to your damper rate uh, which is pretty important so it just allows for a lot more flexibility um, it's worth saving up a little bit more rather than going for these lowering springs and getting something that's going to work out and uh, give you some flexibility so if some things aren't correct you can adjust the ride height uh, to make it level and you know you can adjust the damping and, and the things like that uh, which need fine tuning in order for you to maximize performance number three we have camber kits and camber kits are used to correct the camber 
on a lowered car or to be able to adjust the camber on your car. Uh, contrary to you know what some people may believe which is to just induce as much negative camber as possible. So a lot of negative camber is actually a bad thing. You're going to reduce the amount of grip you have and you're also going to have uneven tire wear and it looks silly while you're doing it. So if you do see excessive you know negative camber um, you know basically if it's visible it's probably excessive. Uh, it's going to reduce the amount of grip you have and it's going to give you uneven tire wear. So here we have a graph of what's kind of typical for a road car and then a race car. On the left we have the coefficient of friction and here on the bottom we have the camera angle. So on the left this is basically uh, the amount of grip that you have. So the higher this is the more grip you have and then here we have the camber angle. So as you're cornering through the car, the car is going to kind of lean into that tire and so a little bit of negative camber is helpful because it maximizes the contact patch in a corner. So with a road car that's going to peak somewhere around negative one to negative two uh, typically uh, for a street car and be, that's because you you know you have about one g of lateral force uh, that you can maximum that you can hold. For a race car it's a different story because they tend to hold higher g's and have different tires uh, with more grip and so it can be a higher number you know it could be as high as three or four even higher than that um, where you know you can really have that car kind of the tire roll over onto itself and you can maximize the contact patch at a higher negative angle there but typically for a road car you're not really going to want to have anything more than negative one negative two degrees of camber probably around negative one uh, maximum if it's something that you daily drive and even then it's totally fine to just keep it at zero you know a lot of cars factory spec will have the camber at zero Number four, we have wheel spacers, and there's different kinds out there. There's some like this uh, where you don't actually have new threads on it. Uh, you just place the threads over it, and you're just pressing out the wheel a bit. Uh, and then these here, which uh, have their own threads because it's thicker. This is a one-inch wheel spacer. And, you know, why would you do this? Well, you may use a wheel spacer because you can widen the track of your car, uh, and with that you're going to improve the handling because you have less load transfer. Uh, so that's one reason to do it. You know, you may do it for looks, something like that. Uh, but why, you know, is this, is this kind of a bad idea? So I did a video proving the math behind putting one inch wheel spacers on a Subaru BRZ. And what the math shows is that it would give you a 1.2% uh, less load transfer to those outer wheels as a result of using one inch spacers. So the handling, uh, you know, benefit of it is very small, but there are some serious consequences that could go along with it. And you know this may not seem like a suspension mod uh, but it's going to have an impact on your suspension so it will change uh, your scrub radius which can increase the amount of tire wear uh, and that changes also your dynamic toe so when you're braking or accelerating it changes your toe characteristics um, and it can change your stability so under braking you may lose stability as a result of that change in dynamic toe Another thing which I haven't written up here uh, is the fact that doing this will change your effective spring rate. So because you've pushed your wheel out, when you hit a bump, uh, that wheel now has more leverage on your spring. And as a result of that, you've reduced the effective spring rate uh, at the wheel. Another thing you're going to be doing, you're going to be reducing uh, the bearing life. Uh, your wheel bearing life because you've put now a higher load on it as you've put the wheel out and so you've got that moment acting on the wheel bearing uh, and you can also damage the fenders um, and you want to make sure uh, you know number one that if you are going to use a wheel spacer that you don't reduce the amount of thread engagement you have so let's say you stack a couple of these on there and now you have less threads holding your nut on you you don't want to do that you want to make sure that that lug nut does have full thread uh, to grip on to and so that your wheels obviously aren't going to roll off so what's a better idea well a better idea if you simply want to widen your wheels or something like that uh, is to buy wheels with the correct offset so you're not going in there and changing some of these parameters uh, that can have negative consequences on how your car handles and number five we're going to be talking about beefy anti-roll bars like this guy here solid steel it is quite heavy so why might you install you know a larger anti-roll bar well you can reduce the amount of body roll for your car and you can you know stiffen up the cornering feel and so you know that can inspire some driver confidence but what are the reasons why you may not want to do this well by installing a larger anti-roll bar you're increasing the likelihood of understeer or oversteer depending on which axle you put it on so what you're doing by putting that anti-roll bar on whichever axle is increasing the rate that the slip angle of those tires on that axle are going to increase. So let's say for example you have a front wheel drive car and you have a lot of body roll so you stiffen up you put a larger uh, front anti-roll bar on it. Well the car already is front wheel drive and it's front heavy uh, let's say it has a front engine and so it's already likely to understeer. 
Now you've put a anti-roll bar up front, uh, which gives it even more of a tendency to oversteer because it increases the slip angle of the front tires as you go around a corner. So it's more likely for the front to lose grip. So a smarter thing to do in this scenario would be to either increase the rear, uh, but there you're kind of sacrificing grip overall, or to reduce the front spring rate if you can get away with it. Now that means more roll, yes, but it means more mechanical grip. So if you were to reduce the front anti-roll bar stiffness of a front wheel drive car that had a heavy tendency to understeer, you would reduce that tendency to understeer. Now the other reason uh, you may not want to just stick on large anti-roll bars is that you reduce the independence of the suspension. So we can all agree that an independent suspension is the best setup where you've got each wheel acting on its own individually rather than linked to the other wheel. But what you're doing with an anti-roll bar is you're linking those two wheels of that axle. And so whatever happens to one tire affects the other tire. If you're going over a, you know, just a curb on the right side and you hit that curb, uh, like let's say on a track, well, that's going to send that force as that wheel moves up to the other wheel. So you're going to be reducing the grip of both wheels rather than just one. So you want an independent suspension. You don't necessarily want uh, the beefiest anti-roll bar out there that you can fit onto it uh, because you eliminate your independence of your suspension and you increase the likelihood of that axle to slide out. So thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those below. And I will have plenty of links to all kinds of videos relating to this uh, in more detail of the different suspension modifications and some of the things you may want to think about and consider if you are going to do these modifications. You add it to your hub and that pushes your wheels out further. So why might you do this? Uh, what are some reasons for it? And what are some of the uh, drawbacks of doing something like this? So I'm gonna kind of work through four different sections here. Uh, first of all,